Hey, good morning. How are you doing? Um, how are you doing, girl? So today is the 26th of November, 2018. And boy, we're coming rapidly to the end of November uh, and the beginning of December. And um, today is kind of a red letter day, a notable day in human history. Uh, today, around noon, the Mars uh, spacecraft InSight, the NASA InSight spacecraft, will be landing on the planet Mars, on the surface of the planet Mars, at about, at about noon today. And so, that's pretty exciting. I have a feeling that it's going to be big news and that the world will be watching. And um, I'm excited about it. I'm hopeful that everything goes well. And, uh, you know, it's something I'm looking forward to today. You know, maybe I'll be able to uh, look at the feed coming in through the internet at nasatv.gov and, um, you know, follow up and, and track the landing of that spacecraft. So that's pretty exciting to me. Um, yeah, that's neat. How many spacecrafts will this be that have landed on Mars? I'm guessing it's the fourth one. Anyway. <laughs> so what else is going on in my world today? Um, well, we're returning from Thanksgiving vacation. So back to work and, um, and uh, there's something else that I've been thinking about lately that's been interesting to me, and it has to do with this idea of subjectivity. And, you know, uh, gra gratitude, really. I've been thinking about gratitude lately. I've been listening to an audiobook called Gratitude. And um, one of the things that I'm recognizing is that a big part of ha being skillful in terms of being grateful for the things in the world is sort of recognizing that, um, you know, basically flexibility is important. You know, I think sometimes we get locked in on preserving a certain basket of values. And I think sometimes we act that that basket of values is the, the only basket of values that exists that's important to us. And, you know, it's, it's often not the case uh, that there, it, it's often true that there are many other baskets of values out there that are as important to us or nearly as important. You know, and, uh, you know, even though, say, one set of needs isn't satisfied by a life situation, another set of needs could very well be satisfied by it. And I think we need to recognize this more in our culture and truly in myself. Um, yeah, that's something that I think is, you know, I think a lot of uh, cultural problems can be solved by just recognizing that, you know, any way of life that's even somewhat successful has qualities in it that are virtuous and important and um, excellent. And, you know, appreciating those virtues uh, goes a long way toward leaving, uh, living a happy and contented life. And, you know, I think, I think we just, I think we sort of undervalue the diversity in the world in terms of the diversity of values and the diversity of meaning. You know, it's like, to me, I think living life is like watching a movie. You know, the fact is, when it comes to our external reality, we only have limited control of, of that external reality. And that, that means that, you know, for, for anything that we're trying to control externally, you know, what we'll do is we'll make our input, our behavioral input, right, into the system. But the system 
makes decisions on what to do next uh, based on lots of other kinds of inputs. Other people's inputs, uh, genetics play a role, uh, custom, society, conditioning, na nature, you know, natural events, uh, like weather and earthquakes and things like that. And, and then there's just, just logical, you know, there are logical um, decisions that thing that, that sort of our external realities make, you know, and so there's this, we only sort of make a contrib, we, we can't fully control our external reality. Now we can influence our external reality, but even that degree of influence um, is not that strong. And so I know we sort of get upset with ourselves sometimes about how we're not as effective as we could be in the world. And you know, maybe that's the case, but even when we are at our most effective, life doesn't necessarily go our way, you know? There are people who are confronted with diseases like heart disease and cancer. And you know, when you're in sort of a, when you're dealing with an external reality of that sort, you know, you can provide lots of inputs uh, to steer the boat, so to speak. But quite often, whatever you do, because of the cancer, um, there will be outcomes that involve things like disability and death and illness and pain, almost no matter what you do, you know, separation between you and your relations. So, you know, thankfully, you know, we have a choice as human beings to decide what we pay attention to. And we have a choice to look at each situation differently. You know, if something doesn't work out like we'd like it to in our external reality, we can still think about, say, the virtues and the values and the character traits that we're preserving and developing uh, anyway. You know, that's something to appreciate and enjoy about the situation, even if you know, it's, it, it doesn't sort of match a picture of the ideal that we have in our minds. So, you know, this, I think this is really important. Human beings have this amazing capacity to look at reality any way that they want. And that is that, that they can look at reality in ways through, they're using their creative senses, you know, their creative abilities they can focus on sort of the adequacy of their external reality um, according to certain baskets of values. Anyway, I think it's really important. I'm, I'm not really, con I guess I, uh, I'm conveying myself hopefully satisfactory, satisfactorily. You know, the idea is just that you know, human beings have an amazing ability. We're not locked in to preserving one set of values. Even though our culture might suggest that it's the case. You know, in fact, our culture is weak in the sense that it so often does look at one set of values as, as being sort of dominant. You know, this idea that there's an objective set of values or an objective or a set of values that's more important than any other set of values. Um, you know, I think it does harm, you know, for example, money, right? And preserving value, you know, that's really important. And it's not important at the same time. <laughs> it's true. Money is both. Money is both important and non important, not important. I know. It's amazing. How can it be the case that both is true? Uh, well, you know, when it comes to moral values, moral values are subjective. It depends on context, really. You know, what, what, what values you're trying or attempting to preserve at any one time. And, uh, you know, that can shift. It can change depending on what's important to you in the moment. 
you know what what part of what life what is what part of life gives your life meaning you know am i am i always looking toward my bank account to sort of ascertain how many uh to to sort of acquire meaning in my life well no uh, quite often it's relationships that is important to my life and uh you know having some money i suppose can help uh, a relationship thrive but not necessarily um Anyway, I'm feeling a little scattered this morning, but um, I've been thinking about gratitude and how um, living life is a lot like watching a movie or even just walking through an art gallery. You know, in fact, walking through an art gallery is a really great uh, way to look at what life is. You know, Moment by moment, you're confronted with new pieces of artwork. And so the question is, how do you evaluate this piece of artwork? How do you know that it brings you joy? I mean, what, what aspects of it bring you joy? What aspects of it do you appreciate and pay attention to? What aspects of this piece of artwork is important to you? You know, I think it's important to be flexible. Um, you know, I know one aspect of art that people pay a lot of attention to is whether that art, the art, the image on the artwork represents reality realistically. You know, how realistic is the artwork? And you know, realistic realism is not the end all be all of artistic values. Um, in fact, there are other values that are worth preserving. Values related to color or meaning or values related to, I don't know, creative, creative, creative creativity and maybe integration of multiple um, art forms, um, multiple elements, composition. You know, there's... There's a lot of ways to look at art. You know, you could look at art differently. And because we as humans have the ability to look at art differently from different perspectives, you know, we can, we can appreciate nearly every picture we look at, say, in that's presented in a museum. You know, that's a really amazing power. It's almost as if there's no such thing as bad art. And you know what? I think I would agree with that. There really is no such thing as bad art. Uh, and there is, uh, and also a corollary to that would be that there is no such thing as good art either. You know, and the good or bad, how good or bad an art, uh, an art piece is, sort of depends on your own opinion of it. And your opinion can change over time, right? And um, life is a lot like that. In fact, I would say life is completely like that. <laughs> yeah. And you, so what that means is that if you're upset about something in your life, Emily, um, it's really your choice to be upset. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's your choice alone. It's not like anyone else is forcing you to uh, think of your reality in one way or another. Now, it might be that others are thinking about your reality in one way or another. You know, there's a um, a trend where more people are evaluating uh, external reality using one set of values and not any other set of values. So you might be in the minority. I can imagine being in the minority when you're evaluating your life. Um, and just as a person might be in the minority when evaluating a piece of art or a movie or a stage play or a book or a poem. I think, you know, gratitude is about what you can 
derive meaning and enjoyment from? You know, what is it in your life that you can derive meaning and enjoyment from? I would guess that any piece of art, like any poem, any film, any painting, could bring more meaning and value to your life. And in fact, you know, I think even pieces of art can be transformative in that way. So long as, you know, as a human looking at that art, you know, you sort of contemplate it in a way, in, in, um, in a way that sort of creates that meaning. You know, human beings are meaning creators. We're, we're storytellers. And, and so we've got that flexibility, that creative flexibility to look at our external realities in ways that transform us. And, and, you know, nearly any aspect of reality can be transformative. In fact, I would even say that any aspect of reality can be transformative. You know, I, I know people who spend a lot of time hiking in the mountains. And for them, that time they spend hiking is transformative. The silence, the nature, the wonder and the awe of it. And then I have other friends, they don't like hiking at all. In fact, sometimes I feel that way. And then, and, you know, for them, what might be transformative is just a cityscape or, you know, the landscape of their own lives, say, even within their own room. And, you know, that can be transformative too. And so, you know, I think it's also important to tread very carefully when sort of focusing on other people's opinions about their external reality, you know, You know, people look at reality in ways that, you know, preserve a set of values that are important to them. And you know what? That it's perfectly okay that they have a different opinion of than yours. Perfectly fine. Let them have it. Let them have it. And you also have the amazing ability to uh, sort of create and sustain your own opinion. Yeah. And, you know, be grateful in your own way for whatever it is that you're grateful for. So anyway, I just wanted to talk about that. I think it's really important that, you know, if for some reason that you're sad or upset or angry about something, Emily, that in a very fundamental way, you're responsible solely responsible for it and nobody else in a way thoughts like that um suggest that ideas like justice might not matter so much oh yeah um and e even human life oddly enough you know, there are a lot of people who um, sacrifice their own lives to preserve a certain story. Now, that's an unpopular view um, because for a lot of people, particularly uh, objectivists, they are quite focused on life and its preservation. And... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. I feel it. I understand it. Um, but I understand, I also understand that human beings in general, as a group, um, they create death in a lot of ways. Um, for example, roadkill, you know, I'm so sad when I see it alongside the road. And I think eventually, the with the coming of autonomous vehicles, um, we will figure out ways to protect animals. I think we'll be able to use um, different technologies that can help us preserve the animals that are trying to cross the street. <laughs> anyway, I guess I'm getting a little far afield here. All I'm trying to say is that 
as human beings, we have the responsibility or we have the ability to look at the world from different perspectives. And I want to encourage you to do that. Having that creativity, that flexibility will make you more resilient. In fact, this message I'm giving you is a message of optimism about what's possible. And, um, and I also want to help you recognize about, you know, your own personal responsibility when it comes to how fixated you are on the baskets of values that you're trying to preserve in the moment. And, you know, it's important to have a basket of values that you're trying to preserve in the more moment. You know, that's all about goal setting and achieving those values. Um, but beyond that, if, if goals can't be reached, there are alternative ways to look at the situation that can sort of preserve your attitudes and preserve your moods. In fact, I think that the human brain probably has a mood immune system. That is, the human brain, if something is goes wrong um, in the story, so to speak, I think the human brain acts to preserve itself and it preserves certain moods. I see it in people all the time. People who, no matter what, are like always happy. But you know what? I also see that people have tendencies in their personality to maybe some, I've seen other people who are like sad all the time. And I've seen other people who are like angry all the time. <laughs> and um, my personality tends to be a little more jovial and optimistic and hopeful. And I'm glad to have my um, attitude immune system <laughs> in my brain uh, that I've got. Anyway, I'm going to move on to another subject because I might be rambling from one subject to another. But yesterday, yesterday we talked about toothpaste and its origins uh, around um, 2000 BC in Egypt. And today I want to talk about whitening teeth, just because it's just the next section in this book. And I wanted to read a little bit about it. We're talking about dentistry. We're talking about uh, how people have managed their dental hygiene. And um, so I'm going to read a passage from this book, Panati's Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things. And we get to talk a little bit about whitening teeth and teeth throughout history. So whitening teeth. In Europe, attitudes about dental hygiene began changing in the 14th century. In 1308, barber surgeons, the main extractors of teeth, banded into guilds. Apart from extraction, the chief dental operation of the barber surgeon was whitening teeth. Brilliantly white teeth were prized, and a barber surgeon would first file a patient's teeth with a coarse metal instrument, then dab them with aqua fortis, a solution of highly corrosive nitric acid. This produced white teeth for a while, but it also thoroughly destroyed the enamel causing massive dental decay in midlife. Still, in the pursuit of vanity, acid clean cleaning of teeth continued in Europe into the 18th century. Oh my goodness gracious. <gasps> wow. Next paragraph. The rough and ready surgery performed by barber surgeons gave rise to the once common sight of the red, white, red and white striped barber's pole. It came about in this way. The teeth extracting surgeons also cut hair, trimmed beards, and practiced the alleged pan panacea of bloodletting. During a bloodletting, it was customary for the patient to squeeze a pole tightly in one hand so that the veins would swell and the blood gush freely. The pole was painted red to minimize blood stains, and when not in use, it hung outside the shop as advertisement wrapped around with white gauze used to bandage bloodlit arms. The red and white pole eventually was adopted as the official trademark of barber surgeon guilds. The gilt knob later added to the top of the pole represented the brass basin that served the profession's dual aspects of letting blood 
and whipping up shaving lather. When surgeons and barbers split, the barbers got the pole. The price paid for artificially whitened teeth was cavities, adding to normal dental decay one of humankind's oldest miseries. Terrified of tooth extraction, people often suffered intense and chronic pain, and many of these people were history's major policymakers. It is surprising that history books omit the fact that, for instance, Louis XIV and Elizabeth I, to mention only two policy-shaping figures, had to render major decisions while in intense dental agony. Louis, in 1685, signed the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had granted religious freedom, causing thousands to emigrate, while he was in the throes of a month-long tooth infection. It had developed into a raw, unhealing opening between the roof of his mouth and his sinuses. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that a king had that problem? Oh my goodness. You know, we have come so far. Thankfully, we live in a time when, first of all, surgeons and barbers have split ways. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, let's see what, what uh, there's more to say. Elizabeth, on the other hand, suffered chronically from deep, massive cavities, but feared the misery of extraction. In December 1578, an unrelenting tooth pain kept her awake night and day for two weeks, necessitating drugs that were themselves heavily disorienting. She finally consented to extraction after the Bishop of London volunteered to have one of his own good teeth pulled in her presence so she might witness that the pain was not unendurable. Throughout the weeks of misery, she had continued to oversee legislation that affected the lives of millions of subjects. In more recent times, George Washington suffered throughout his adult life from decayed teeth, gum inflammation, and the inadequacies of 18th century dental treatment. From the age of 22, he lost his teeth one by one, and he acquired a succession of dentures that nearly destroyed his gums. From a wealth of documentation, it is clear that America's first president endured almost continual pain and found chewing nearly impossible later in life, and that the likely cause of his eventual deafness was the an unnatural posture he forced on his lower jaw in an attempt to give his face a natural appearance. A volume of speculative, speculative history could be written on the effects of severe and protracted dental pain on policymakers. <laughs> oh. Wow. That's amazing. You know, I'm going to just read this uh, part about fluoride toothpaste because I'm interested in it. I don't know if you're interested in fluoride toothpaste, but believe it or not, fluoride toothpaste has become kind of an issue. Uh, particularly, I'm talking about the fluoride, fluoridated water, in fact. Um, let's read. It would be hard to imagine that the toothpaste sitting on a modern-day bathroom sink does not contain some fluoride compound, most likely sodium monofluorophosphate. But the use of fluorides to reduce cavities is not a 20th century phenomenon, though fluoride toothpastes are. In 1802, in several regions surrounding Naples, Italian dentists observed yellowish brown spots on their patients' teeth. The spots turned out to have resulted from an interaction between natural variation in human tooth enamel and a high level of fluorides occurring in local soil and water. What no Neapolitan dentist could ignore was the fact that the spotted teeth, however unsightly, were cavity-free. By the 1840s, in both Italy and France, France, dentists were suggesting that people from an early age suck regularly on lozenges made with fluoride and sweetened with honey. The first scientific trials with fluoridated drinking water took place in America in 1915. The results were so encouraging that in time, fluorides found their way into water, mouthwashes, toothpastes, substantially reducing the incidence of cavities. Wow, isn't that interesting? So it's kind of interesting that people just, dentists just kind of happened upon this knowledge about how fluorides made teeth impervious to cavities. Oh, yeah. And I could imagine, you know, in the Middle Ages and uh, in the Enlightenment, that, you know, all the people suffering, you know, all throughout history, people suffering from dental problems and then noticing, I mean, what, a, what an amazing discovery, noticing that fluoride 
I mean, if I were a dentist and I noticed that fluoride was preventing cavities in my patients, I would just go, I would just go, I would just have so much energy around the subject, so much passion about it. I would want all of my patients to have fluoride, access to fluoride, you know, in order to preserve their health and preserve my own health too. So, wow. So fortunate to live today when fluoride is readily available. And believe it or not, none of my teeth have cavities in them. You know, and then I was thinking too about the whitening procedures that people would go through in the past using nitric acid to whiten their teeth. And it did so in a way that essentially destroyed their enamel, which made having cavities in the future a near guarantee. You know, you know, it makes me wonder how tooth whitening today is different. And um, I wonder what kind of clinical studies have been done on teeth whitening and whether we whether whether we can do it today with having minimal impact on long-term dental health i'm curious about that anyway well thank you very much panati's extraordinary origins of everyday things book <laughs> appreciate it so let's see what's going on with me today well we might as well go to the question and answer period so, Emily, this question and answer period is about you getting to know me a little better. I picked up this Kindle ebook and it's got a lot of questions in it. And I just wanted to um, ask myself the questions so that you can get a sense of who you are and who I am. And uh, that is who you are in terms of your history and maybe get a little bit more understanding about what who I am and what my values are and what my experiences in life have been. And I don't know, it just sounds like something that's fun. It's in a way it's kind of like trivia questions, right? Where um I'm asking myself these questions and answering them. I don't know, it's fun. I don't know. Human beings we like problem solving, right? I don't know. Emily, I know, Emily, I know that you really enjoy puzzles and putting puzzles together in a way. This is kind of like a puzzle game and I'm liking it. Okay, so the next question. Question number 395. If you could travel through time, what period would you live in? Wow. Well, first of all, I think I would live in a period that occurs in the future. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, Living today in the present moment is just fine. We've got a lot of great technology now, but we still have lapses in certain areas. For example, heart disease and cancer. And I would definitely like to live at a time when those have been eradicated. So I think that if there was a time that I could choose to live in, it would probably be in the future. I would think that you know, not only would culture have developed a little bit more, uh, maybe people would uh, say be more educated, uh, but also diseases like cancer and heart disease might be eradicated. And um, I would imagine too that anyone with a serious injury could be healed more rapidly at a time in the future. So. That is something that would be interesting to me. Now, that, now, if I had only, the only choice I had was to live in a period sometime in the past, when would that be? Well, you know, believe it or not, one of the things that comes to mind first for me is the age of dinosaurs. I would really like to check out the age of dinosaurs. Now, I don't know if I could survive very long in that age, I would have to sort of probably live in a metal cage to prevent all the velociraptors and Tyrannosaurus rexes from eating me. Um, and in fact, I'd probably, it would have to be more than just a, a, an iron cage. It would probably have to be some kind of 
um, clean room <laughs> to protect me from the viruses and bacteria that I don't have immunity to. <laughs> Serious, that existed during that time. Yeah, I, I could imagine that environment would be so hostile to me that I couldn't live unless I was sort of encapsulated <laughs> somehow by protective um, measures. But I would like to check out the world of dinosaurs uh, that lived, what, 70 million years ago. I would definitely like to see those big animals like the Brontosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus rex. And I would love to see like just all the variety of animals and plants. That sounds really interesting to me. Now, are there any other periods of time that I'd like to live in? Well, I know. I can tell you about periods of time that I probably wouldn't like to live in. Like I was thinking just a moment about Victorian England. And based on what I know, I would not want to live then. <laughs> you know, that sounds like really tough, a really tough way to live. You know, a society that is so rigid and insular, I think I'd have real trouble living there. Um, what would be a place in time that I would like to live? Boy, a place in time in the past. Well, maybe I'd like to live in America, say, during the 1920s. That might be interesting. Or in the Old West. That might be interesting. Um, I, the California gold rush. I don't know. Those times, those periods of time in the past were really hard. Really challenging for physical survival. You know, maybe maybe if I wanted to live at a different time, I, it would be the 80s. Right? The 1980s or maybe even the 1960s. You know, that would be something that's just reasonable. Like, I go, I can do that. Or I could live in the 1990s. <laughs> Give me the 1990s. I know, it's kind of funny how, you know, there's so much potential in this question. You know, if you could travel through time, what period would you live in? And it turns out that a lot of my answers are just 10 years ago or five years ago. <laughs> how about last year? Maybe I could just relive last year all over again. Um, the reason, I guess the reason uh, for that is because, you know, p the past has been really challenging. I mean, just think of World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam Wars. You know, those are really troubled times. And, you know, only now has human culture developed so that there is relative freedom about how to live your life. You know, people can choose to get married or not. People can choose to be, say, one gender or another. You know, there's a lot of gender fluidity. Um, so that's freedom. You know, there's freedom when it comes to um, having kids or not. Freedom about, there's a lot of freedom because uh, wealth produces freedom, freedom to travel. You know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, people traveled, but, but traveling was a great hardship and it took a long time. Um, maybe, here's a, an interesting answer to that question. If you could travel through time, what period would you live in? What if I lived in, a, in the world that existed just one second to go. <laughs> How's that for time travel? Yes. I'm gonna travel in time back to five minutes ago. Yeah, now that's if I had to travel back in time. And if I could travel into, into the future, how about traveling five minutes into the future? <laughs> then I would be perfectly adapted to live in that environment, that social and physical environment. Ta-da! Yeah. 
Okay, so next question. Question number 396. What is your favorite children's classic tale or story? Golly, there's so many. My favorite children's classic tale or story. Well. Hmm. My favorite children's classic tale or story. Well, you know, one story that comes to mind is like Br'er Bear and Br'er Rabbit. Another story that comes to mind is like uh, um, Grimm's Fairy Tales. Favorite children's classic tale or story? Well, Grimm's Fairy Tales comes to mind, that's for sure. Um, and when I, when I look Little Red Riding Hood, for example, and, um, um, what was the three bears, Mary and the three bears, I forget how, what it is. Um, what other classic favorite children's classic tale or story? Well, one of the first things that I thought of was Winnie the Pooh, because, I recently read the first installment of that series um, in preparation to watching the movie. There was a movie about the Winnie the Winnie the Pooh creator that came out a little while ago. The movie, by the way, wasn't very good, <laughs> but um, I did enjoy reading the book. It's kind of funny when it comes to these story tale uh, fairy tales or uh, children's stories, there are certain aspects of fiction that are tough to swallow sometimes. People making really odd decisions, but I guess that's part of what makes fiction so enjoyable, right? <laughs> How unpredictable it can be. All right, next question. Um, question number 397, do movie endings usually annoy you? <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, they don't. In fact, directors do a fabulous job of quite often wrapping up the story, at least, at least in the movies that I watch. And, you know, if they're going to leave uh, sort of the audience hanging about an ending to the story, I think directors do it very consciously. You know, they're very much aware of doing that to the audience and... Um, you know, they want the audience to have a good experience. And so I think that in certain contexts, it is expected that movies have unresolved endings. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's happening a lot more and more these days because movies are parts of movie series now. You know, there's like the Star Wars series or the Star Trek series or the Marvel and DC Comics series uh, for superheroes. And so, you know, right now I'm sort of just getting used to having endings that are unresolved. I mean, even the Harry Potter series was like that. And, and even the Fantastic Beasts series by J.K. Rowling. Again, another example of, you know, basically a movie ending mid-story. I think that's just becoming a lot more common. And does it annoy me? Not anymore. Maybe it used to, but it doesn't anymore. In a way, it's nice that the movie, I mean, if I enjoyed the movie, I really liked it, then I don't want it to end. And I want it to continue. And I'm looking forward to seeing the sequel or the rest of the next movie in the series. So, I mean, if that's the case, then an, an ending that sort of, doesn't end, you know, is good. It's hopeful, you know, that there's going to be another movie coming out soon that I can enjoy even more. Okay, next question. Question number 398. Is there, is a warning label on your forehead? Oh, okay. Question number 398. There is a warning label on your forehead. What would it say? <laughs> um... <laughs> What would it say? A warning label. Well, there is one thing I think that comes to mind is what might be on my forehead. And it would be, 
I'm not quite sure how to describe it. I think the label would be something like multitasker. Or it might be something like attention deficit. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. I have two aspects of my personality and they're very divergent and they're also very apparent. Number one is I have this ability to be consistent, dedicated to a certain pattern of behavior. I love patterns of behavior and I love just sort of um, being in a certain line of behavior and then sticking to that set of behaviors. I just love that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person of habit. On the other hand, I also have a mind that can move from topic to topic rapidly. And so it's kind of interesting to have these two areas of my personality that represent such a dichotomy. You know, there are aspects of my personality that just love doing the same thing, the pattern. And that there are other parts of my personality where I'm just distracted. And even I am challenged when it comes to figuring out um, the two. And I really, I'm not sure why my brain chooses to act one way and then another, uh, or an, and then another. You know, I've got this constancy about my personality that is a force of nature. <laughs> and then I've got this other constancy where I'm just flittering about. And I, I don't really know how to describe that dichotomy of traits. But the reason what, for the warning label is that I think it can sometimes be a little surprising to other people about, oh, he's gonna do this every day. <laughs> you know, and the, oh, I wonder why he's choosing to do that every day. You know, I can imagine people being in wonder about that. And then I can also imagine people recognizing just how quickly I flutter from subject to subject. Um, and I can imagine them being somewhat annoyed by it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why, that's the reason for the warning. The, because I think it might be surprising. Now, I have a feeling to, I, I, I know other people who are just like me. Uh, and then I know people who are a lot different than me. So, you know, it kind of, I guess it, a lot of it depends on the personality, but I think that that's what it would be. It would be like this, um, that would be the warning. I don't know what it would say on it. I guess it would say, um, uh, well, I liked, I liked what I said prior. So, okay. Next question. Question number 399. Have you been to a live concert? And oh yeah, I sure have. I've been to a number of live music concerts. And you know what? There's something about live music which, which is just compelling. It's fun to dance to. It's really, um, um, there's something about live music. I've Now I've danced to both uh, just DJs and I've danced to live bands. And what I like about the DJs is that the music is constant, right? It's often um, constantly good. It's certainly, it's certainly at a level that's predictable. Whereas a live band, you know, the audience could be turned on or the audience could be turned off about the performance. And, you know, it's not always, and sometimes, Live bands have the potential to be amazing, through the roof amazing, and they have the potential to be much less than that. Whereas DJs are just pretty consistent, right? They've got that certain standard of music that they're playing, they're predictable, and it's great. So I think the highs and lows, there's more potential for highs and lows when listening to live music. And then DJs are just this nice, constant, you know, maybe there aren't super duper highs with DJ music, but um, you know, what you get, at least it's something uh, that is 
understandable, comprehensible, and you can, you can figure it out, and it's constant. It's, con it's consistent, and I like that about DJ music. So have I been to a live concert? Yeah, I've been to a number of them. I've been to Sting, and um, I went to Metallica one time, and um, what other ones? I've been to quite a number of concerts. A lot of the musicians, here's the thing about me and musicians, I don't track them that closely. I went to go see Troy Sivan down in Los Angeles, the Greek theater, uh, just about a month and a half ago, or maybe even just a month ago. And I'm thinking about going to the Lucidity Music Festival this coming April. So anyway, there's, there's more live music concerts on the way. All right, question number 400. Boy, I'm almost done with these questions. Question number 400. Do you play the lottery based on dreams? Do you play the lottery based on dreams? Okay, so the question is really, do I play the lottery? And the answer is not really. Um, the last time I played the lottery was probably five, six, seven years ago. Uh, would I play the lottery again? You know, there are certain lotteries that I'm more prone to contribute to than others. Um, uh, this uh, Santa Barbara house giveaway lottery, I like. But that's like the only one. And like I often don't um, participate in any of the national lotteries or in the state lotteries. I, it just doesn't seem to me a valuable waste of money. Sometimes though, when I hear or read about winners that won like $56 million, I, uh, I ask myself about the wisdom of not participating in the, live, in the lottery. You know, you miss 100% 100 of the shots you don't take. <laughs> and uh, so, I don't know. It's not something I do. I don't really care for, for, for gambling at all. Okay, next question. Oh, well, actually, that question, it, it continues. Uh, question number 400 says, do you play the lottery based on dreams? Well, based on dreams. I think that everyone plays the lottery based on dreams, right? That's the point. It's sort of hopefulness and optimism. You know, it's about the player and what they could expect if they won. You know, that's really the point of it. You know, it does play on a person's dreams. So everyone plays, I guess my argument is that everyone plays lotteries based on dreams. Question number 401, do you know people's phone numbers by heart? <laughs> and the answer is no. There are very few people's phone numbers that I know by heart. In fact, I think I may only know mine, my personal phone numbers, my work and home phone numbers, because why memorize anyone's phone number <laughs> with cell phone technology today? Yeah. Next question. Question number 402. Do you laugh at offensive things or jokes? Well, it's hard to have a choice of laughter because quite often the outcome, you know, the answers or the, the phrases, the turn of phrases are just hilarious. And, um, but, you know, I also do get somewhat um, concerned about offensive jokes. And uh, personally, I don't tell them. In fact, as a rule, I don't tell jokes that um, sort of are at another person's expense. I've learned, I've, I know I have enough social skill to recognize that that is generally a bad idea. <laughs> if I want to create goodwill between me and other people, saying jokes that have punchlines at other people's expenses is just a bad idea. And you know, another thing is jokes that I stare away from are self-deprecating jokes. Especially, well, they can be mildly self-deprecating, but 
if they are strongly self-deprecating, I avoid them. <laughs> because I don't I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure nobody wants to hear jokes like that. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah, you know, this whole thing about how comedy is changing in culture, I think it's real. I think comedy is definitely changing. The comedy that sort of did well and flew like in the 1980s and 1990s probably much of it would not fly today uh, in 2020 um, or near 2020. Our, our, our humor is changing, uh, at least here in the United States. You know, I'm stand up comedy. It, it did have a time in the future when it was like brilliant. You know, I can remember comics like Seinfeld, you know, just really making a, a hit, you know, but, you know, I see things changing up, you know, having a sense of humor today, true is actually really important and important and interesting. But I think that comics today are standing on eggshells more and more these days. There seems to be something of an intolerance to offensive thinking. And, uh, and a lot of jokes are just happen to be kind of weird and offensive. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it gets us to think about old subjects in new ways. And, you know, that there's, there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also a lot of risk. You know, being a comedian is a risky endeavor. It's risky. You know, quite often you're playing in conversation out of bounds on some subject or another. And so... Yeah. All right. Next question. Question number 403. Have you ever walked out of a really bad movie before it was over? Well, I've actually walked out of movies because they were too good. <laughs> like I remember I went to a horror film called Seven a long time ago. This was way back in Albuquerque when I lived in Albuquerque. And I might've been say 24 years old. It was so scary. It was so good and scary that I had to walk out because I was terrified. <laughs> but, you know, if a movie is really, really bad, I've only walked out of maybe one or two. And you know what? When I walk out of movies, I walk out of movies, often it has little to do with the movie itself. Quite often I'm hungry or I'm crunched for time or... You know, I'll walk out of a movie for an entirely for an entire for a reason that's entirely different from the movie itself. Um, yeah. Next question. Question number four hundred four. What songs best relates to you, or what song best relates to you? What song best relates to me? <laughs> you know, these questions are somewhat vague and uh, unclear. Maybe a better question would be, what's my favorite song? <laughs> um, what is my favorite song? You know, I'm not sure I have one. I have artists, music artists that I really enjoy. Like I like pop music. So um, singers like Lady Gaga or um, Katy Perry are singers I enjoy. I know. It's pretty run-of-the-mill. My taste in music is pretty run-of-the-mill. I also like, uh, who I've really been enjoying lately is um, Christina Aguilera. Not Christina Aguilera. Um, who else? Well, I like Pink. And, you know, th these are all musicians that can be found on the radio station dial. <laughs> Excuse me. I got the hiccups. Next question. So I don't, I don't really have a best song. Next question. Question number 405. Do you have a long lost, do you have long lost friends you wish to reestablish a connection with? Well, absolutely. I would love to reestablish a connection with anyone that I had a friendship with in the past. Absolutely anyone. Oh, hey, by the way, I'm going to start wrapping things up. <sighs> Sometimes I get carried away. And um, so thank you for bearing with me. So um, I just want to say, 
how much uh, I really have enjoyed spending this time with you. I want to thank you for bearing with me uh, as I uh, move from subject to subject. <laughs> but, um, and I just want to say, you know, I value you. I think to me, you are important and I'm proud of you and, and I'm proud of, you know, who you are and what you've done. I'm noticing that you are really into track and field these days, really into running. And it just impresses me that you're so active, you know, as an athlete. You know, your mom is a really strong athlete. And your dad has that potential to be a strong athlete, too. I haven't quite got there yet. But um, you have some really good genes when it comes to athleticism. And I'm really glad that you're sort of exercising those genes. <laughs> anyway, I hope you have a fantastic day today. And... I'll check you out tomorrow, right? I'll see you tomorrow. Same place, same place, same time, same bat channel. I'll talk to you later. Peace, girl. Bye-bye.